Hello, my name is Sean Sands, and this is the new game from Paradox Development Studios called Imperator Rome. Uh, I want to send a thanks to Paradox, who provided me early access to this game, uh, which, uh, as of recording and publishing this, is out in a week. So this is a pre-release version. Uh, obviously, there may be some changes in advance. I will be setting up a official full Let's Play of uh, the Country, um, which will be the next video to go up uh, today. Um, but in this first episode, what I really wanted to do was spend some time and talk about what you do and what you look for before you actually start time in your game. If you played a Paradox Grand Strategy game before, you know there's inevitably some setup and some things to uh, pay attention to and learn and understand. Uh, the point of this video is exclusively to go over how I, over the past uh, number of hours that I've played, um, have approached that beginning setup of your game. Uh, for this episode and for the game at large, I will be playing Macedon. Um, there's a lot of things to understand and learn here. If you want to spend some time with it, this will help you uh, uh, make some good decisions about the kind of country you want to play. Um, things like government matters. It tells you the number of ideas, number of types of ideas you can get. So, for example, as an aristocratic monarchy, as Macedon, which is what I plan to play, uh, we would get one military idea and two oratory ideas. Uh, whereas if you played something like Sparta, uh, you would get, uh, because they are a stratocratic monarchy, uh, they have two military ideas and one oratory idea. Or if you play uh, one of the settled tribes, which is um, essentially a, a version of sort of the barbarians, um, you don't get, you're, you're going to have some, some uh, you're not going to have the same kind of organization as something like a Rome or a Macedon. You'll only get two ideas and two benefits. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I can come back and cover this separately if, if we're interested, but I really want to uh, dive into the game. Um, for Macedon here, we start with the opening intro uh, explanation of Alexander the Great. Uh, Babylon 18 years ago, the Argead King Alexander died suddenly at the age of 32. In the five years preceding his death, his continuing military successes had reshaped the world as known to the Greeks, his empire stretching uninterrupted from Egypt to the Indus. The shock of Alexander's de early death and his lack of a chosen successor sent shockwaves through the hierarchy of satraps and generals who attended him, splintering his empire into elements ruled by these potentates styled as the Diadochi. For many years, they and their successors have been locked in a bitter struggle over the future of the empire, drawing all nations within the sphere of influence in the conflict. The wars of the Diadochi will surely continue. Perhaps it is up to Macedon to decide how they will end. Uh, I want to start with just sort of understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at the map here. Obviously, there are tons of different map modes, and uh, I'm not going to go through these at this point. But just sort of fundamentally, the way you address certain levels of how you perceive the map is a little different. This game is more like Europa Universalis 4 than almost than any other immediately evident uh, paradox grand strategy games, but it has lots of elements from other games as well as uh, uh, its own sort of individual take. Um, if you play to you before you're used to looking at this level and seeing all these different shapes here um, and thinking of them as the province level, uh, sort of the main level of the game. Um, that's handled differently here. These are cities um, and each city, if you click a city, you'll see highlights into a province. And province is really to me the sort of the base um, home level of the game. When the game is thinking about what your country is, it's thinking in terms of different provinces. Um, because a lot of the cities in provinces share a lot of the same benefits, they provide a lot of the same output. Um, you can see here as I click through the cities in this province, they all have the same trade goods that are applied to them, meaning that they're either producing it within that province or they're importing it uh, as part of that province. Uh, and if you click to a different province, so for example here we see this is the province of Macedonia in the country of Macedonia, uh, the city of Toriana. If we click over here into the city of Larissa, uh, it's part of a different province, the province of Thessaly in Macedonia. And it, this province uh, gets different bonuses and benefits and abilities based on the um, uh, the trade goods that come into it. So 
um, Thessaly is different than Macedonia, is different than Macedonia Secunda, uh, and so on and so forth. So as you're thinking about your country, obviously at country level, um, and there is in fact even a region level, um, the base level really is around provinces. Uh, so first thing I tend to do is pay attention to my troops. These gray troops are not my troops. These are mercenaries that can be hired um, and cost some amount per month. They don't really exist in the world beyond that. So until a uh, country has claimed a given mercenary group, um, they won't impact wars. They won't impact manpower. I don't think they even impact supply limit uh, for a given city. Um, but you want to begin by looking at your troops and probably putting a commander in place. Um, you can click that little button to add or change commander. Um, and when you think about characters, and you can get a list of all characters here, there are important elements to any given character that will apply to whether you want to add them as a general or whether you want to put them in a position of government or whether you want to you know, try and minimize their power and take them out of positions of power. Uh, a lot of decisions. This is where the game is most like something like Crusader Kings 2. Um, each character, every character in the game has four traits, has four sort of ability uh, measures that are sort of like the, um, uh, the way that rulers in Europa Universalis 4 had three, um, three numbers applied to them that fed into uh, the monarch powers. Um, this works similarly, but it applies to a lot of different cases. So, for example, Cassander and Tepatrit here, who we happen to know as the Basilius of Macedon, um, has a martial ability, which applies most to his opportunity to add to or provide value to military um, endeavors of seven. Uh, I believe these go zero three through, I don't know what the top is. For example, we see here somebody who has 11. I want to say 12. Yeah, I've seen a 12 before. I think it may be 0 through 12. Um, 12s are pretty uncommon. Uh, this range of 7, 8, uh, really 5 through about 8 seems to be the most common. Uh, so he has a martial ability of 7. He has a finesse ability of 6. Finesse tends to apply to uh, technology and innovation. Um, charisma applies to... Uh, uh, what do we call this oratory power basically the power to influence people in the government or people from other countries uh, and finally zeal is corresponds to religious um, and inspiration elements um, these other elements here are also important uh, particularly when uh, when thinking about a, uh, a general which we'll get to in a second uh, we also have health and age and how much individual wealth a certain person has and these come up less often well age doesn't right I mean age is gonna come up when they get old and, uh, and are on death's doorstep uh, but individual characters have a degree of wealth and what they can do with that wealth uh, really matters they also have traits again this is very Crusader Kings 2 uh, familiar and depending on what positions they hold in uh, the government or in the military these uh, diff have different effects Okay. It's a lot to take in. Don't, you're not going to remember that all at once, but it's important to know that those traits exist uh, because you'll be applying them in different ways in different places. So, for example, obviously, uh, I think obviously, when selecting a, can a commander, the most important thing is that martial ability. Right? This is how well they will be able to lead this group of troops. Not to be discouraged in that, though, is loyalty. So um, loyalty is absolutely critical when thinking about putting a general in place uh, because there's a lot of things that impact loyalty and as loyalty changes, that can also impact uh, whether you even eventually lose control of that army or it turns against your entire country. Uh, so for example, Alexander Antipatrit here has a loyalty of 70, but you notice his loyalty automatically changes by 0.2 a month because he's a pretender to the throne, which means every month you have him uh, in any place, whether he's in charge of this uh, army or just sitting here, he's just going to lose loyalty unless you're doing stuff to keep him loyal. Um, in addition, uh, when characters are very popular, um, and they're in a general position a position as a commander of an army, uh, over time, your cohorts, your troops, will change their allegiance from an allegiance to the state to an allegiance to the general. So if, for example, we put Alexander in charge of this 
over time, you would start to see some of these, if not all of these troops, change what they are, where their allegiance is from Macedon to Alexander. And the more troops Alexander has uh, loyal specifically to him, the faster his loyalty drops. Uh, the more he starts to think, well, I could be in charge of this. I should start a civil war. Um, so really, I mean, I think our best option here, because I don't necessarily want to put our ruler in charge of uh, uh, in charge of this particular army. Uh, Eucrates, uh, Prepolau, not sure, anywhere near pronouncing that correct, uh, has a high loyalty that is not reducing. He's not a pretender. He doesn't have high popularity or prominence, which means it's going to take a while for his troops to change their allegiance to him. Uh, and he is a decent marshal. So that's who is going to run the show over here. The other thing you want to do on this screen is change the way the army is sort of set up its positioning, its the way it engages in battle. This one took me a long time to find and ultimately click. Um, so this army is made up of a combination of archers, heavy infantry, and light cavalry. Uh, you can see here by if depending on the way we set this army up, we will get different benefits to the effect of this. And so I'm inclined to change our positioning from a shock action, which provides no bonus to our archers or our light cavalry, but provides a, you know, a decent bonus to heavy infantry. We'll keep that bonus to heavy infantry, but we'll also add some light cavalry effectiveness by creating a phalanx uh, approach. So those are the things you want to change there. There's a lot going on on this UI um, and which is why, as I said, uh, hopefully I said, uh, for this video, we are not going to be unpausing. Uh, we, this, is, this is strictly looking at the different uh, UI elements and understanding what to do before you click pause. Uh, I will be uh, continuing this in a separate video, which will actually start the official Let's Play of Macedon, where uh, we will be kicking off time right away. So let's go in uh, a little bit. First of all, we saw that nation overview. Um, important here is most important early on is determining what your ideas are going to be so these buttons right here little question marks are things you can click um, where you will have a selection of ideas that you can apply to your nation as a whole uh, each of these cost 50 oratory power um, and they have some sort of benefit you'll notice above each of these is the kind of idea it wants it to be now you don't have to click that if i click this and decide no i want this to be a civic idea that gives reduced build cost and time instead i can absolutely do that but if i put a military idea here oratory idea here and oratory idea here I'm going to get this bonus over here. So you can see the bonus is currently inactive uh, because I do not have matching ideas. Um, if I do, my tyranny goes down, my citizen happiness go down, and most importantly, we get more of our primary powers. Let's talk about powers for a second because like I said, each character has those powers or, or each character is applying this and if as far as the Basilius of Macedon or the leader of a country, uh, they directly impact these powers. These powers, military, civic, oratory, and religious, are the bulk of the currency that you will spend in the decision making you do. Um, you can see that all of them change at a base of plus two. Um, and then next, the bonus from the, uh, the leader is applied. So plus three, right, is coming out of Cassandra Antipatrit. Now, he has seven, so why plus three? The amount that the leader applies to the power is this divided by two and rounded down. So it's half of whatever their ability in each of these areas is rounded down. So, right, this becomes um, a bonus of three uh, because it's seven divided by two, rounded down to three. This finesse, we will go up here and see this is also a plus three. And indeed it is, base plus two. Uh, Basilius is adding plus three for a total plus five. We're not gonna do great on charisma uh, and we're not gonna do, we're gonna do eh on religious, which means each of these things is going to go up by that amount monthly. Um, that makes these all the more important, right? Having your ideas in place uh, to get that bonus uh, becomes really important because that's going to increase most of these uh, by almost a third. 
Um, and these are powers that you're going to use quite often. This is stability. If you play to U4, you're familiar with stability. In essence, it goes from minus three to plus three. You have to spend religious power to increase your stability, uh, but it gives sort of net effects, positive effects to research points and loyalty and national tax and all these other things. Aggressive expansion, as you aggressively take territory around you, this will increase, um, which has some negative effects, particularly around diplomacy and tyranny. Um, is just how autocratic you are. Treasury, right? This is something we'll address a little more in a minute, as well as manpower. So that's what there's really. So if I were starting right away and making a huge fo focus on ideas, I might click these and start adding ideas. But keep in mind, this is 50 oratory to add each of these. So it would tap my oratory power, and I have something else I want to do with that first. The government. So we have, again, our Basilius, we have his heir um, and the amount of support for that uh, ruler because this is a direct descendant. Philip IV is uh, the son, the oldest son of Cassander. He has very high succession support. Uh, and you can see here he has a lot of supporters. We do have some pretenders to the throne who may, uh, um, you know, may do some devious actions to try and take over that, uh, to lure supporters away or subvert the throne in some way or possibly even kill Philip. Uh, but these are all uh, the same family right now. So I don't know if that makes it less or more likely. But this is a pretty secure, this is about as secure as you can get. You have a uh, not very good leader, and I may want to here. Notice that Philip IV has relatively low power scores, right? He's a three, three, five, three. Whereas, do we have any good ones? Oh, good Lord, no. Um, well, he's still a boy and he's growing his scores. Um, yeah, I mean, and, uh, Antipater Antipatrid, uh, and that is a name for the ages, uh, is slightly better. So at some point it may come to me to start deciding maybe I don't want this to be the successor. Uh, we also have, um, different roles to be played. So these are essentially like um, advisors or members of the government. Uh, there are two for each uh, each um, power type. So two military influencers, two um, oratory influencers, religious and civic. Uh, and you can change who is in these roles. Uh, and you'll think about, again, here things of, does this make a person more popular? Are they loyal? Uh, do they have a decent skill? Um, so, for example, a philosophus here uh, provides a monthly legitimacy of 0 0.05. That's fine. Our legitimacy is fine. I don't care uh, too much about that. But if we had somebody with maybe a zeal of nine, we might want to think about replacing him. Uh, Hierophant. Um, omen power is super important. This provide, we'll go over omen powers in, in a little bit. Um, but his uh, five only produces an omen power of plus 10%. If you add someone with a 10 in here, your omen power would be increased by 20%. Uh, easier to kind of uh, think of here is um, morale of armies, right? It's a one to one. If we put someone in here with like a seven or eight or nine um, uh, uh, martial skill, then the morale of our, our armies would go up. So you're gonna to wanna to look these over. Probably they're optimized from the starts. Um, another thing we can you can eventually look at is the laws. Not something you're gonna do right away, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but you can change these for a good cost of oratory skill, because you're gonna to have to convince the government, right? The idea of maybe here being, uh, you're gonna to have to spend a lot of speech capital, a lot of uh, ability to make a strong case to change the laws of the land. Military, super quick here. Um, as you gain military power, when you reach a certain threshold, you'll be able to gain one of these three top uh, traditions, which provide a universal bonus to all military units. Um, you can also eventually go down this line. So once you've opened the Sarissa, on the next tradition you get to choose, you could choose Tarantine Advance. Um, but if you have, but over here, for example, if you have not already chose Ajima, you will not be able to train, uh, choose arms for hire. So every every time you reach this threshold, you will be able to choose one of three from each column um, at its lowest level. And once you've selected it, it stays permanently. So once I've selected the Sarissa, I have heavy infantry and morale for the rest of the game, and now the option to advance down to Tarantine Advance. Technology. Uh, so here, 
you have, we are all starting at level zero uh, for our technology levels. Over here are the technologies that exist in those technology zero levels. So each element, each uh, power, martial, civic, oratory, and religious has three associated um, technologies with it, which you can spend civic power, 100 civic power to buy. So at the start of the game, I can buy two of these technologies. They will apply immediately. I do not have to research them because they're part of our current tech level. So I could choose property tax and starting experience, and those would apply immediately. Over time, you can see here that at a rate of about 0.9% per month, we will increase our technology level. When we hit the next level, current level being zero, next level being one, because that's how numbers work, um, we will get new technologies over here to be able to choose from uh, once we have the civic power to buy them. You can obviously store civic power and save up for a next level if you don't see something you like in this list. Um, and as you open up, if you've researched, you know, all the tech level threes there are, it will reduce down and show you what other techs that you passed over before. Um, research points applies directly to how quickly your research progress is. Things like efficiency and monthly research are, they're a little bit more in depth and you want to spend some time understanding that. Uh, religion. So omens are a thing that you can, are another way that you can apply a specific benefit to your entire nation all at once. And you can choose one of these. It'll cost 200. And then for, as it stands right now at our current technology level and benefits, uh, anything, any blessing you apply will last for 1,825 days. Now you might remember earlier we were talking about the Hierophant and his application, the fact that he is here with a zeal power of five, he gives an omen power of plus 10. Here's where you actually see that, right? So this discipline um, would be 5.0 but because of various benefits, including the Hierophant, it goes up to 5.4. Um, so this is something you probably want to select right away early in the start of the game. There's not a ton of other reasons to save your religious power. Um, and you probably also want to select a few starting technologies right away. Um, those, are, those are things I tend to do. You can also save your omen power or your religious power, I keep moving the screen, uh, do a sacrifice to the gods, which is how you increase stability. So you'll have to make a choice early on whether you want to focus on stability or add a blessing very quickly. Uh, economy, it's hopefully relatively straightforward um, in that they've even simplified this versus Europe Universalis 4. You can either, uh, the middle effect here for any of these is the sort of normal effect. Um, but if you need to recruit, reduce army maintenance, uh, you can't pay, you don't do it with a slider anymore. You just do decrease pay, all their morale goes away, but the cost gets a lot lower. Conversely, uh, you can sort of boost pay. So let's say you find yourself in a pitched battle against an evenly matched or even stronger opponent, um, you could make the case to come in here and do increased pay. So you get that bonus to morale, uh, even though it's gonna cost a lot more. Um, or increase your fort maintenance to, you know, jack up the fort defense. Um, using these is actually more interesting in some ways than it was in something like EU4. Um, but this is this is where you're going to maintain your economy. You can also you can convert your economy into specific uh, powers, which is not something that existed in um, EU4, for example. Diplomacy. This should be the most familiar. Um, and this is where you can also change your ideas uh, and you can also see the ideas once uh, we unpaused that other uh, countries have applied. The most interesting thing here and the thing you probably want to address right away is your stance. And this is another one that took me a while to find. Uh, we are starting with a bellicose stance, which reduces um, the opinion of all our neighbors and anybody within diplomatic range, but it makes our wars easier to fight. It costs less to fabricate a claim. Um, and it costs less to demand things from uh, our enemies. Um, there are other stances that you can take from a diplomatic perspective. Um, it will cost 100 oratory power to change that stance, but if you're not planning to fight a war or you're not too worried about how much that war is gonna cost from a 
fabrication point of view, um, you might change to mercantile to increase your commerce, increase your trade routes, or you might just change to neutral to increase your diplomatic relations. Um, being specific about the stance you take is not a bad idea. Uh, decisions is similar to EU4 decisions there, uh, where if you want to change your government type, uh, or you want, to, you know, each, some countries have specific decisions. I think Rome has several decisions, but for example, for Macedonia, if we wanted to reunite Alexander's empire, where we get a bunch of benefits, um, we have to, you can see here, uh, own a number of specific provinces. And as you hover over, you'll actually see them light up in green, like right here. If we don't hover, nothing, hover over this, and they show up. Um, but, you know, if you want to change your government type, this is usually where you're going to do it. If there are specific um, sort of story or uh, advancement-based stuff you're going to do, um, you can do it there, I think. Um, yeah. A lot of the bigger countries or the more prevalent countries have more decisions that you can make. Trade, I, I think getting into that in, in the game is probably makes more sense. Um, but each um, has a general idea. Um, your home province has a certain number of trade routes uh, it is able to hold based on, I think it's a base of one, uh, plus as you increase your power rating, um, you become like if you as you move from being simply a local power to a regional power to uh, if we look at something you can see, you can see here, here I'll show you um, we can see here we're a regional power here the benefits we get for that if we go to something like Phrygia they are a I mean I forget where to look at it here anyway we know they are a major power which should be here somewhere Mm, uh, you can see it here. If we go into Alliance, you can see Phrygia is a major power, which means they will get different benefits. Yeah, here it is, major power. Uh, so they get an extra trade route, for example, as one of their benefits. So your, your capital province gets these trade routes, which allows you to import, um, depending if they're available, specific um, trade goods. And each trade good has its own... Uh, specific benefit and having a surplus of trade goods adds an additional benefit. Um, you can also have a trade route in your province if see, I want to see if any of mine have this. Okay, so in the province menu you can change your governor policy. So let's say we were looking at our province of Shalkadiki. Shalk Chalki Diki. Sure. I, hopefully that's correct. Uh, the current governor policy is to improve the civilization rating of uh, the, uh, the this province, but you could potentially change that. There is one in here, Encourage Trade, uh, which lets you add an additional import route. So as you gain technology, as you gain decisions, as you gain policies, um, you can change the number and the benefit of the trade routes you have. Um, it's worth it to spend some time looking at the benefits any given province has. So for example, if you don't have wood in a province, either as something that you are creating there, it's one produced in Cortina. Yeah, where's Cortina? Come on. Here. You can see that it is producing wood, whereas this um, the army, whereas Pella is producing two wine. Um, so, for example, if you don't have wood, you can't make boats unless you import wood. If you don't have horses or import horses, you can't make cavalry. Uh, if you don't have iron, which notably uh, we do not have. Um, do we have it in any of our? Yeah, we do here. Um, unless you have iron, you can't produce heavy infantry and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a benefit in kind of seeing what you have um, in, in your uh, province and what you're lacking. For example, grain is great for population growth. Fish is good for population growth. Uh, wine is great for happiness, but only for freemen. Um, and glass provides additional commerce income. Uh, spend some time with that. 
Uh, we looked at the character screen and we looked at the mercenary screen. Uh, so that gives you kind of a brief overview of what the UI gives you. The things to do when you start the game are probably most importantly put a, uh, put a commander in place of your armies. Um, think about what national ideas you're going to take. Now the reason I haven't taken any yet is because I'm probably going to actually spend my oratory power to, um, to conduct a fabricate claim. So you're going to have to make a choice early on uh, between are you going to quickly try and start a war, which you'll need to spend your oratory of power on, or would you rather stabilize your government and start collecting those bonus uh, powers. So you're going to want to make a decision about your ideas. Uh, you're going to want to look over your uh, advisors and make sure you're happy with them. You probably will be. And also check who any pretenders are and whether they have support um, or a loyalty problem. Nothing to do in military tab. I mean, look at it. It's fine. Uh, so we will do our ideas. We will glance over our government. Um, probably what I will normally do is select two of these available inventions uh, at a cost of a total of 200 civic power. Um, and again, I'll base that on, am I planning to attack very soon? Am I, you know, just hemorrhaging money so I might talk think about property tax uh, do I want to get my tech technology going faster um, I will choose an omen so nation overview technology omen or uh, sacrifice the gods to increase your stability if you feel that will be more uh, effective um, and then I'm going to want to put my trade routes in place uh, those are sort of I would say the primary ones you want to do and a lot of those are noted here right you still have these uh, these items that will give you important information. This is telling me I need to put a trade route in place. This is telling me I need a commander. This is telling me, um, well, I don't need a commander. So I have one now, it just hadn't updated. Um, oh, what is this? Oh, I also need a commander for my boats. Uh, and I will probably put, let's see, he's brave. Morale of armies, though. Still five. He'll put Helio. Heliodorus here into this. Um, and I'm going to be watching out at some point to get better people in the government that have higher things like Marshall. Uh, inventions are telling you to look at technology. Oma's telling you to look at religion. And that's it. Once you do those things, you're kind of off to the races. I mean, there's lots more to do. That's the whole point of a game like this. Um, but if you're anything like me, you spend a little bit of time before you get started and clicking that pause button um, to think about some of these things, uh, how you're going to approach it. And the first few times I played, there was a lot of that I didn't know, which is why this exists. So hopefully this helps get you started in Imperator Rome when it comes out. Um, and if you're interested in seeing our uh, my Macedon uh, Let's Play, uh, that should be up or coming up very soon. Anyway... My name's Sean Sands. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, if you have, if you found it valuable um, and it helped, um, you know, obviously leave a comment, leave a like, do, do the things you do on YouTube. If you have questions of things I can answer uh, in maybe a follow-up video, uh, also feel free to leave that in the comments as well. Until next time, my name is Sean Sands. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you again real soon.